Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Cavan Smith. Tonight, Nigeria's security troubles is a battle with many fronts. The UN warns that 20,000 people have fled from the northwest into Niger alone because of violence in the area. That alongside the ongoing threat of Boko Haram and the spiking clashes between herders and farmers elsewhere in the country. Also, Sudan sees workers walk off the job for two days of a general strike over protesters' demands that the ruling military generals who overthrew longtime leader Omar al Bashir last month transfer power to civilian authorities. And silk production that's traditionally been based in countries like China and Japan is on the decline, just as Kenya's rise in the world of silk worm rearing sees more farmers moving away from traditional cash crops like coffee and maize. But first, deter the, the deteriorating security in Nigeria's northwest has sent around 20,000 refugees flooding into Niger in under two months. The UN's refugee agency has warned that communities in the area have faced a barrage of separate violent incidents, including ethnic clashes, kidnappings for ransom and attacks by criminal gangs. On Tuesday, 23 people were killed in Zamfara State by gunmen on motorbikes who attacked two villages. Now, the country's northeast has also been faced with the Boko Haram insurgency for about a decade now, and the UNHCR says that the dangers faced by populations in the different areas are unconnected but equally as serious. The reality is that people who come uh, or who have arrived in Niger speak of, uh, of extreme violence against civilians and also the reality that 20,000 are now refugees in Niger. The worry is uh, this adds a new dimension into the ongoing conflict uh, that is already affecting Nigeria. Well, President Mohamedou Buhari is due to be inaugurated for his second term on Wednesday, and he so far struggled to stay on top of the string of security challenges facing the country. Sam Olakoya joins us now with more. Sam, first of all, can you tell us more about why so many people have fled from Nigeria's northwest? Tell us more about what's happening there. Well, in Nigeria's uh, northwest, especially Zamfara State, we've seen what you can call a breakdown of law and order, where you have a large number of armed men carrying out attacks almost at will, attacking villagers, killing people, not one, not two, killing, sometimes killing as many as uh, 30 people, blocking the highway, kidnapping people. And here again, we're not talking of one or two persons. Sometimes they take almost 10, 15 vehicles away together with their passengers. So that's, that's the level of lawlessness we have seen in, uh, in the Northwest to the extent that lives and property are no longer safe. And for this reason, many people are fleeing the area. And how does all that compare with the Boko Haram insurgency, which is based more in the northeast? Uh, what state is that in at the moment? Well, here again, we are facing a very serious uh, crisis. I mean, it's four years since uh, President uh, Muhammad Buhari came in. And if you have to look back four years, agreed that... Uh, Boko Haram has lost quite some territories. But then Boko Haram remains a very potent threat. Today we have two major factions, uh, one aligned to ISIS, and uh, that one has done a very uh, serious job killing soldiers. So many soldiers have been killed. Agreed, we've not seen much of the bomb, uh, suicide bombings, but in terms of uh, killings, the killings have still uh, continued. And when we say Boko Haram has lost territory, that doesn't mean that uh, those territory are safe. A large chunk of uh, not just Nigeria, especially Borno State, is not safe at all. So you don't have people there. So this, again, is yet another serious uh, crisis, security challenge in Nigeria. And with Buhari's government facing so many security challenges all at once, can his government realistically keep on top of all of it? 
Well, to be honest, uh, I don't see how the government can tackle this because if you look back four years when Buhari came in, Boko Haram was just, uh, that was the security challenge. But today we are talking of the Northwest, we are talking of Central Nigeria, where you have uh, former Hadas clashes. So we have at least three major crises that has stretched the Nigerian military to its limits, that has stretched the Nigerian Air Force to its limits. I can't think of any country as of today that has deployed a large chunk of its troops internally for internal and security. So if we are to have a fourth uh, crisis elsewhere in the country, or maybe external uh, threat, I'm not sure the Nigerian army will be in a position to uh, bring in troops to quell such a crisis. So definitely we are facing a very serious crisis. Thank you very much. Sam Olakoya there for us in Abuja. Well, thousands of workers across Sudan joined in a general strike on Tuesday in a bid to heap more pressure on the ruling military council to allow civilian leadership to head up a transitional authority. Since the ousting of President Omar Bashir last month, protest leaders have been locked in laborious negotiations with army generals. Flights and public transport took a hit during Tuesday's action, but demonstrators say that it's just a first step. From bankers to civil servants, transport staff to municipal employees, Sudan is on strike for two days. Our strike is so we can express our demands, which is for a Sudanese revolution to hand over power from the ruling military to a civilian government. Sudan's generals ousted Omar al-Bashir six weeks ago after 30 years in power, as protesters in the street for months demanded change. Once Bashir went, the umbrella protest movement and generals began sketching out a framework for Sudan's future. However, both sides are now at loggerheads over plans for the military to take a back seat to civilian authorities on the sovereign council which currently runs the country. We do not have any weapons except for civilian weapons. And we will follow the steps of civil disobedience and open strike until our demands are fully met. There was initial agreement between the army and protesters over a three-year transitional period before new elections can be held and the creation of a 300-member parliament. Though for the time being, military authorities have resisted calls not just from protesters but the West too to hand over power. At least 32 people are thought to have been killed in a boat disaster in Dio Congo over the weekend. The death toll has risen and dozens more are thought to have drowned. The vessel went down on Lake Mai Ndombe on Saturday. Local authorities say that the vessel was unfit to transport passengers and that its owner has since been arrested. And South Africa's vice president's finally been sworn in as an MP. The ruling ANC party has said that David Mabuza's swearing in as a lawmaker came a week late because he had to address accusations that he had brought the party into disrepute. Mabuza has been trying to sidestep allegations of being connected to graft accusations that have dogged the ANC's reputation. He denies doing anything wrong, and the NC now says that the fact that he's been given the go-ahead to take his seat in Parliament means that the Integrity Commission has given him the all-clear. Now, silk production has traditionally been based in countries like China and Japan, but the industry has long been in decline. That, though, has been matched by Kenya's rise in the world of rearing silkworms as climate change sees more farmers moving away from traditional cash crops like coffee and maize. Breeding silkworms for the production of raw silk has existed in China for 5,000 years. It is now becoming more and more popular in Kenya. Farmers are preferring it to traditional cash crops like coffee, maize, sugarcane and cotton. Climate change and unfavorable weather patterns have led to low earnings in those sectors. But rearing silkworms, which is known as sericulture, is less dependent on the weather. In countries where it is hugely done, it's getting down. The production is lowering in China. It has more or less completely reduced in Japan. And in India, it is, uh, India is doing well with the, with the silk. So we feel that Kenya can contribute to global silk demand. 
For the farmers, it offers a stable source of income that comes every three weeks when they deliver their produce. Silkworm rearing on an acre of land can fetch up to $15,000 annually. Newton Owino now employs 15 people on his silk farm. This is the 26th day, and you can see the, uh, the silkworm are, are already spinning. Uh, they are making uh, cocoons. Uh, in other words, uh, they have already reached the stage that we call uh, pupil stage. Yeah, so as they, as, they, as they spin, we harvest our cocoons. Silk is not only used for textile and fabrics. It's also included in the manufacture of contact lenses, films, soaps, skin products and toothpaste. Last year, the world's largest silk producer, a Chinese firm, announced plans to create a silk processing factory and farm in Kenya. If successful, the venture is expected to create more than 300,000 jobs in the East African country. Well, that's it for I in Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again. Take care.